Hey there, my name is Matt Rabel. Today I'd like to show you how to build a progressive web application with React, Spring Boot, and JHipster. Let's get started. I wrote a blog post that shows you how to do all of this. It's called Build a Photo Gallery PWA with React, Spring Boot, and JHipster. Published on the Okta developer blog. And it basically goes through some intro stuff and then shows you that you need to install Generator JHipster 5.0.1. So I already have that installed, you can see here, and we'll make everything arrange nicely. So we'll start out by creating a gallery, oh wrong command, seeding into it, and running jhipster. There's going to be a number of questions it asks us about jhipster and the type of application we'd like to create. I'll go ahead and create a monolith, call it gallery, octa.developer, or com.octa.developer. No for the jhipster registry, we're going to use OAuth 2.0, SQL, Postgres, H2, each cache, Hibernate second level cache, Maven, and we won't choose any other technologies, and we'll use React. No to SAS, internationalization, yes. I'll go English and French, since the, uh, the original creator of JHipster, Julian Dubois, is French. And Protractor to make sure everything works. So you can see that took a bit of time to create, about 7 minutes and 30 seconds on my Mac. If you're using Linux, i found that you can get that down to only a couple minutes, so there's some speed difference just in NPM install on the two platforms. So now we can verify everything works. This will use Keycloak by default, so I'll go ahead and start that. Using docker compose source main docker Keycloak up. So jhipster ships with Keycloak by default configured for OAuth 2 and it has a docker image that basically imports the default users and roles and sets up a client for the jhipster app. And then we can also start up this app with MVN for Maven. And then we can start another window that runs our end-to-end -end tests. And this will just kind of give you an overview of what the app entails, what's in it, and, uh, and some of the screens. So it'll be quick, um, but we'll verify that everything works as well. Hmm, Keycloak failed to start. Let's see, why could that be? Because we don't have Postgres up? Well, I'll start Postgres if that's what you want. I don't think it should need Postgres though. So. so after doing some research, it turns out that Keycloak will detect if you have Postgres on your local host and, uh, and use it. So here's, uh, here's the JBoss Keycloak image, and you can see here the database um, supports H2, MySQL, Postgres, or MariaDB. I've never had it choose Postgres before, but for some reason it did this time. And uh, you can specify the DB vendor with an environment variable. So in source main docker keycloak I've added db vendor here as h2 so now we should be able to do docker compose source main docker keycloak up and I'll use h2 instead of postgres so if you get that problem now you know how to fix it and then we'll want to start our app using mvnw And I'm using iTerm here, and the shortcut is Command Shift D to do the spleen, the screen splitting. So once the app start up, we can run yarn e to e, and it'll drive our browser and show all the different screens that are configured by default, and log into Keycloak and make sure that that works.
you can see there's some nice information in those protractor tests that take or tell you when some of them took a little longer than expected. So the good news is they all passed and we can proceed on to the next steps. So KeyCloak does have the ability to actually turn on user registration. If you go to localhost 9080, uh, jhipster when it ships with JWT authentication has a sign-in link on the home page and when you're using OAuth it doesn't. So that's because the IDP can actually do the user registration for you. You can also turn on like forgot password, remember me, and all that. So if we do that then we go to our app, localhost 8080, and if we click sign in, you'll see now there is a register link. Well the other thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to roles and set the default role that someone gets added to because if you don't then jhipster limits the user access to role user and role admin and if you don't have those well you're just not going to be able to do anything but log in. So we'll set that and I like to set the uh, default users as well or the default group under default group add users and add it there. And now if we open up a new incognito window and go to localhost 8080 and we can sign in and then you can see you can register so we'll just use my information and one thing you don't want to do is for the email use something like mrabel plus you know keycloak at gmail.com because jhipster prevents having plus in the username so that'll fail just to warn you there um, I'll just go with mrabel password and then you can see I'm, I'm logged in, I'm registered, there are no entities, um, I'm not an admin so I can't really navigate around but hey it's working you know I added a new user so that's pretty cool and just to show you what happens in the actual database I'm gonna open this up in IntelliJ um, we have a user syncing feature or a save user snapshot feature which means as soon as you log in the app makes a call to slash API slash account and that will look and see if that user's in the database and if it's not it grabs their information from the IDP um, Spring Security handles like grabbing it from the user info endpoint for OIDC and it saves it into your database that allows you to have relationships with the user object using JPA so it's a pretty nice feature I developed it myself I like how it works and I'll, uh, I'll go through that as soon as IntelliJ starts up here it does take a little while to initialize that's because of indexing and uh, the node modules directory is of course millions of lines of code so uh, IntelliJ struggles a bit with that but after you've done it once then it should be fast from then on so if we look at account resource you can see that there's this account mapping for slash API account there's API there's account and it says is principal instance of OAuth 2 authentication and if it is it calls get user from authentication the reason for this else block here is so you can still do tests like you normally would without having to worry about an IDP or OAuth 2 being involved so if you click on this get user from authentication takes us to the user service and here it basically grabs the details and converts the claim the roles claim from Spring Security from the IDP, in this case from Keycloak, and converts those to authorities in Spring Security. And then this sync user with IDP is a method that goes ahead and says, hey, does this user exist? If they don't, or if they do, go ahead and just, you know, check when they're last updated. And, uh, you know, if it's after it, then, you know, just update the user. Um, if no last update, then blindly update them. Otherwise, go ahead. I like it because it's basically a cache of your user information and there is no way within jhipster within this architecture to actually write back to the user table in the database so it's always just a read-only record and the next time that person logs in that record will get updated so you saw how to log in with keycloak uh, why would you want to switch to okta so okta is an identity provider as well there is no uh, local version that you can download and install it's cloud native it only works in the cloud um, but it's great for production because it's always available, it's always on. 
Keycloak, you would have to up, upload it, you would have to host it, you would have to maintain it and upgrade it and stuff like that. So that's why I like Okta. Also, I work for them, so I'm a bit biased there. Um, but it gets multi-factor authentication, email support. Um, you get basically a thousand users a month for free. So I encourage you to sign up for a developer account to make it happen. So um, to see how it works, I've created an Okta.env file on my local host that has the information in it that I need. If I look at that, octa.env. Oh, spelled it wrong. You can see it's got Octa with jhipster, access token URIs. Those are my um, Octa tenant, that URL right there. And then I have a client ID and a client secret. And so to create those, here's the steps. You basically log into your Octa developer account. And I'll just show you what that might look like. Um, so if I go to admin and then you'll normally see this developer console at first not the previous screen but you can click on applications and you click on add application and you click on web next and then you'll basically configure the login redirect URI to be localhost 8080 login, that's what Spring Security uses. Um, group assignments, just everyone. Authorization code flow, the best code flow for OAuth. And, uh, and then you could click done. Um, I won't do that since I've already set it up. But I also want to show you that you do need to set up the roles in a claim. So in your default authorization server, you'll navigate to claims. And you'll see I have one for groups and one for roles. You can name it either one. It'll work with both. Um, so if I was to add a new one, just to show you what that'd look like, you can call it groups. You put it in the ID token. You set it to groups as a value type. And then a regu regular expression and do dot star, which means everything. And then you hit create. So I've already done both of those, so I don't need to. Unfortunately, the audio for this screencast stopped recording at this point and got all jumbly, so I'm going to have to do voiceover for the rest of this, and uh, we'll make it work that way. I showed you how to configure self-registration with Keycloak. Now let's see how to do that with Okta. If you log into your Okta tenant, you'll need to switch to the classic UI up in the top left corner and then go to directory self-service registration and you can enable it it's disabled by default and you'll want to specify that you want to add it to the sign-in widget and assign it to a default group called role user and so as part of the blog post I went and created those users ahead of time a role admin and role user to match up with what jhipster has and then you can accept the defaults except for the custom URL which you'll want to set to localhost 8080 for this example for production you'll want to change it to your actual production URL now let's configure the application to use Okta instead of Keycloak I'll source that .okta.env file with my settings and restart Spring Boot And so what that file does is just override the access token URI and all the client ID and client secrets that are specified in application.yaml under source main resources config inside jhipster or inside your app. There's also other customization options uh, via our live widget. You can see we actually have a way of modifying the widget in real time and seeing what that looks like. You can modify the CSS, you can add various features, and basically make it look just like you want it to. So it has really no Okta branding, it just has your branding. Once the app is up and running, you can hit localhost 8080, click on sign in, and now you'll be using Okta instead of Keycloak. Since I've already logged into my Okta tenant, you don't see any sign in screen. You just see that, hey, you're logged in as user with the appropriate email. 
Now you'll notice that if I click login again, it just logs me in again and I don't see the sign in screen. That's because similar to Facebook login, if you log in with Facebook to a, an application and you log out, you don't want it to log you out of Facebook. So that's what we do with the JHipster integration. There is a blog post I wrote last week that shows you actually how to implement global logout in a JHipster app or basically a Spring Boot and Angular app. Um, it's this one here, deploy your secure Spring Boot plus Angular PWA as a single artifact. If you uh, search for logout in that post, you'll see that you can implement local global logout. Um, but now let's let's get to the meat of the post and actually create a photo gallery um, that allows us to crud albums, photos, tags, um, and we'll use the JDL Studio feature for this. So JDL stands for J Hipster Domain Language. It allows us to model out how our entities might look, their relationships, and if they have pagination. You can see in this file that I have an album with a title, description, and created date, as well as a photo with title, description, image blob, and then height, width, uh, the date it was taken, the date it was uploaded, and tags, just like you know we can tag anything these days. You can select the whole file, or you can download it using the icons on the top right. I'm just going to select the whole thing, and then copy it, and then I will cancel my server and create a gallery.jh file paste the contents into there and then I'll run jhipster import jdl and specify the file name and this will create everything you need to crud these entities It'll create the relationships between them. It'll create the Spring Boot code and the REST endpoints. It'll create the liquid base files that it needs to create the tables. It'll create integration tests. It'll create unit tests. And uh, yeah, it's pretty slick. And it'll run Yarn to basically build everything, compile everything, and uh, make it all work. There's a number of fields that can be calculated instead of input by the user. For instance, the image's height or the width as well as the taken on date or the uploaded date. And so we can use Drew, Drew Noakes' metadata extractor library for that. And so all you need to do to basically integrate it into your project is add a dependency on the library in your palm.xml. So I'll go ahead and copy the dependency information, group ID, artifact ID, and the version. open palm.xml and then jhipster provides a nice little gap right under the jhipster framework dependency where you can paste in new ones and then I'll modify the photo resource in the create photo method to set that metadata or to read it And then I'll copy and paste the set metadata method just below it. And I have IntelliJ set up so it automatically imports unambiguous imports. Um, we just need to add one for Java time instant. So you can see here this reads the date digitized, sets that. If it's still null after it goes through there, then it sets it to now, it sets the, the data was uploaded, and then it grabs the height and the width as well. The set metadata um, throws that image processing exception, so I'm just going to change this to throw exception. And now that class should be good to go. So just to show you what it looks like before we actually added that logic, I'll log in and upload an image and you'll see that if we don't specify width and height um, then it won't have one. So navigate to photos, click create a new photo and just pick one I have on my hard drive here. Nice picture of the Arc de Triomphe my wife took a few years back before we were married. Beautiful photo. click save 
and you'll see there's no height, no width, invalidates uh, for taken and uploaded. So now we can restart the Spring Boot API and I'll grab that new code. I could also just compiled it or recompiled it within IntelliJ and Spring Boot DevTools would have restarted it for me. Now I'll add a new image. Uh, this is a bug that I noticed that if you actually refresh the page in React in jhipster501 it takes you back to the home page rather than the page you were on. Um, that does work in Angular. Uh, it's just a bug that's broken in React and I added a, an issue for that so no worries it should be fixed soon. So click create a new photo. This time we'll go ahead and select that same photo give it a, a different title and click save and now you can see the height and the width are calculated as well as the taken and uploaded dates. So now a number of those fields you can't really enter because they aren't read um, so in the UI I'm gonna go ahead and hide uh, those fields when you're creating a brand new photo or uploading a new photo so open up photo update dot tsx and in the render method there's uh, all these properties that it grabs from the photo entity itself and right under there I'm gonna basically grab all of the rows for height width taken on uploaded date and I'm going to put those into a variable so we can basically show them or not show them. So grab all that and I'm going to call it metadata rows and so I'll create a new const variable called metadata and we're working with React every component or every JSX needs to have a root component so I'm going to wrap everything in a div and then I'll paste all that in there and then when we're showing this for edit screens we're going to want to make those fields read only we can still display them but we don't want to allow the users to modify them so I'm going to add read only to all of the fields and you'll notice that it's camel case that's because we're in reacts JSX and uh, it's not reading the actual HTML attributes. So once I have that in place I can create another constant and call this one metadata rows and if the records brand new then there'll be nothing it won't show those rows otherwise it'll show the read-only fields. And there's also protractor tests that set those fields so we'll go into photo.spec.ts and we'll find that code that's setting them since they won't exist anymore we're going to want to delete those and then if we're not going to set them we might as well re re remove the code that actually deals with handling that And now we can actually use Yarn to start just the front end, and it uses Webpack Dev Server to proxy to the back end and proxies the API slash API to the uh, port on 8080. So Yarn start, and then you don't have to rebuild the front end and restart Maven. They'll also open the browser window for you to localhost 9000. So now you can go and look at the photo entities. We can create a new photo and you see those fields are gone. And if we were to edit this one, you'd see that they're read only. So cool, that's working. Now let's add React Photo Gallery, the component. This is from Neptunian. And uh, it's a pretty slick library because it basically gives you a flicker like layout in a grid and makes everything kind of fit together has features like lightbox um, dynamic number of columns and it'll even allow you to to drag and drop things to 
make it all work. So the light box component is pretty slick. You've probably seen light box before, but you just click on the image, then you can navigate between them. It's like a zoom in feature. So I'll open up a new terminal because I don't need to stop yarn start. Everything should work um, without it. And yarn adds the exact number instead of a range uh, for the version. So I like to do that so this video will always work even if there's a new version of React Photo Gallery. As long as you use 6.0.28, everything should work. So open up photo.tsx, add an import for the gallery component, and then we'll leverage the existing photo list. We'll map that and grab the URLs and the width and the height and calculate whether it's a, a, a wide photo or a tall photo or if it's a square photo. And so that's what the, uh, the numbers there are for. And then right under the heading, the photo heading, we can add the gallery component pointing to that photo set list. So as soon as the dependency is done installing, then we should be able to refresh our page and see the changes. And there you can see it's displaying that in a grid format. There's only one, so can't see it that well. So let's go ahead and add another one. We'll do a picture of uh, some old Volkswagen buses. Now we have two. So it's looking pretty good. We can add another one. I don't have any that are tall, so it won't really make a difference. I'll just skip that part. Now let's turn this into a progressive web application. So progressive web applications uh, must be served over HTTPS. Uh, they must register a service worker and they must have a web app manifest that gives information to install them. So in the index.html, that's where the service worker gets registered. That's actually commented out by default. So go ahead and uncomment that and then there's the web app manifest. This defines your installation settings like your name that the user will see as well as icons that they might see after you've installed it on a phone or on a desktop. So I'm just going to change these to be a little friendlier. And then to set it up so it's always going over HTTPS when you deploy it to something like Cloud Foundry or Heroku, you can actually look for an exported proto header. And so in security or security configuration.java, you can add this code that says basically, if you see that header, force HTTPS. So that's a great way to, to force it on those platforms. So we'll go ahead and paste this code in here that says, hey, if I see that header, make it secure. And so the Workbox Webpack plugin is something that works in Webpack to actually generate that service worker for you. So um, if you were to look into the Webpack directory, into the prod configuration, then you will see the code in there for that. Um, the beauty is that this only happens when you do a production build, so normal development, uh, you don't worry, have, have to worry about your browser caching too much information. To verify everything works, let's deploy it to Heroku where we can run Lightbox or Lighthouse, sorry, and uh, and confirm that we have a bona fide PWA. So you'll run Heroku version just to make sure you have the Heroku CLI installed. Um, if not, you'll need to go and install it. There's links in the blog post to do that. Um, even though there's a number of errors here, you can see that it does print out that I have Heroku um, installed. So now I can do JHIPS to Heroku. And I'm going to cancel all these other windows just so there's no resource contention between files. No prompt me to name my application on Heroku. 
I've used gallery-pwa in the past when I practiced this demo, so I'm going to use gallery-pwa-screencast this time. And we'll choose the US, and I'm going to use git to compile it on Heroku. So this will this will use the existing git repository, push any commits that we've had, and then overwrite files to add the Heroku plugin to Maven, and it'll start building it on Heroku. So you can see that took uh, about eight minutes. If you're actually doing this and recording a screencast, it seems to take forever. Um, so I've sped things up and spared you that. Um, you can do Heroku logs dash tail to see if it's actually started on the server side. And you'll see that it has. So we can do Heroku open. And there it is, it's up and running in production. If we click sign in though, it's, uh, it's still trying to get to key cloak. Um, so to fix that, you can actually run this Heroku config set. And this is also documented at jhipster.tech slash security um, under the OAuth section for both Cloud Foundry and Heroku. So this will set those environment variables and restart the app for you. So now we can do Heroku logs tail again and see if it's restarted. And the nice thing about doing it this way, I think, is that your GitHub repo where you store your app will have the key cloak settings. If you're on a plane, it'll work with key cloak everything's fine and then uh, in production um, you'll go to Okta and because all your client ID and client secret are in environment variables it's a more secure way of storing that information than actually storing it in the application.yaml file. So we'll do Heroku open And now we can test how we're doing on a PWA. First, I'll log in um, because I think that's a, a bit more accurate. Oh, this happens when uh, when there aren't any variables. So if you do security and there's nothing there, that means you didn't do Octa ENV ahead of time. And so now, if you echo security, there should be something there, right? Client ID. And so before I just set it to a bunch of nothingness, so back to uh, grabbing this code here, trying that again. So yeah, the first time I saw that, I was like, what? Like I just configured all this. Um, so that's because there's no environment variable set. It. You basically set it to nothing, and uh, this is kind of the indication. It prints them out when you did set it to something. So. We're almost there. On this particular test, I got 100 on Progressive Web App and Accessibility. So that's really nice. Now I'll do it with this new one here, Heroku Open. And log in. Oh, the redirect URI isn't in there. So um, that's important to know. We have to configure our app to have that new production redirect URI. So this is gallery PWA screencast. We go into admin, switch back to the developer console, applications, and let me see which one this is. I'm going to guess. Huh. Easier to look. And 
need to go into the application under general and you gotta whitelist all the login redirect URIs. So I need to add a new one here and specify a login at the end. Save it. And now I'll be able to log in. So you can see I'm logged in as Mrabel there and I can generate a PWA report. Let's see what we get. 91, not bad. I got 100 last time. You run it a couple times, you'll get 100 too. So, uh, so that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, screencast of building a React photo gallery of Spring Boot and J Hipster and OAuth. Um, if you're interested in learning more about all of those, there's a number of links on this blog post here. And uh, thanks for watching, and hope you have a great day.